Good evening. My name is Thomas Kajistavropoulos. I'm the director of the Center on Aging and Health. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for coming here tonight instead of going to the briar. Uh, uh, Dr. Tracy Gentron, uh, I'd like to welcome you to the University of Regina Main Campus, which is located on Treaty 4 territory. These are the ancestral territories of the Nahiyawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, and Nakota people, and the traditional homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. I'm making this acknowledgement here today very seriously, not offhandedly, as a small step toward improving relations among nations. Um, before I introduce the speaker to you, I'd like to um, do two things. It's going to take about three or four minutes. I I'd like to ask first to help me save some money for the Center on Aging and Health. Um, we spend a considerable amount of money on promoting these events, and I'd like to know how effective our promotional strategies are. So the first thing I would ask you with a show of hands, if you could tell me how many of you are here because you saw an ad in the leader post. Two, three. Um, that was $1,700 well spent. Um, how many of you are here because you received an email through the University of Regina listserv? Oh, that's a fact, then that was free. <laughs> and how many of you uh, saw a poster? Okay. And how many of you are here because you heard an interview uh, by Dr. Uh, Gentron this morning uh, through CBC? So a few there. So our single biggest advertising investment is a total bust. Um, <laughs> But it is my pleasure to, int oh no, no, there's one other thing. Sorry, I have another thing to do. Um, this is gonna be a terrific event tonight, uh, but next week we have another very good one coming and I'd like to tell you a little bit about that. Exactly a week from today at 6.30, um, we're gonna do a screening of a documentary at the Education Auditorium um, called Alive Inside. This is a Sundance Festival award-winning film, um, and the award they, they won was, um, um, uh, what they call it, People's Choice Award. It's about people with severe dementia, and many of them being quite unresponsive. And then they start playing their favorite music, and then, they begin to smile and dance. And after the film, we have an expert live from the University of UPEI who knows all about the impact of music on dementia to do a Q&A with the audience. So it's gonna be terrific and I hope you can come to that. In the meantime, keep the music on. Uh, even if it's Taylor Swift. Emily. <laughs> um, so Dr. Tracy Gentron is the chairperson of the Department of Gerontology at um, Virginia Commonwealth University where she's also a professor. She's also the executive director of the Virginia Center on Aging. And she has been a very productive researcher having published many uh, influential articles. But I think it's fair to say that in the last two years, the biggest splash was made by her book, uh, Ageism Unmask, Unmasked, Exploring um, Age Bias and How to End It. Uh, Dr. Gentron have, uh, has dedicated her career to uh, battling ageism that is embedded and pervasive across all cultures, situations, and in most individuals. Uh, she's determined to uh, contribute to a more inclusive and equitable society that creates space for older adults to grow and, and become engaged. And I'd like you to welcome her now, uh, Dr. Tracy Gentron. Thank you so much, Thomas. 
Hi, everyone. It is so nice to be here. Yay! I see familiar faces because I got to hang out with some of you before. So I'm, I'm really happy to be here to have this conversation with you. Ageism is something that I think about a lot. It's something that I've researched a lot. And it's something that is more important than most people realize. So we're going to kind of you know, walk through some of this a little bit. But let me first ask you, who in here considers themselves part of the aging population? Let me see hands. OK, keep your hands up. For those of you that don't have your hands up, who's older today than they were yesterday? <laughs> yeah, OK, so there we go. Yeah, we are all part of the aging population. It's something that we are all doing every moment of our lives. But we tend to misunderstand aging in a couple different ways that I'm going to share with you. But first, another question. Who here knows what a geriatrician is? Just a couple people. What about a gerontologist? OK, so most people don't know the difference between a geriatrician and a gerontologist. And this kind of speaks to kind of our misunderstanding of aging. So a geriatrician is the branch of medicine that deals with some of the problems, the issues, and the concerns that older people have. And that's a really important branch of medicine because there's definitely things that happened and complexities and ways that our bodies change over time. So a geriatrician is focused on biological aging, how our bodies change. A gerontologist is someone that is trained in the biological, psychological, social, and often spiritual aspects of aging. So it's very different. It is not just focused on a branch of medicine about our bodies. It is focused on all of the different ways and components and dimensions of our aging over time. And part of the issue that leads to ageism is this misunderstanding that aging is just a process of decline. When we think of aging as something that only happens to our bodies, then we miss all of the ways that we grow and we change and we evolve over time. So that's one thing that we misunderstand that leads us into ageism. The second is that we identify the aging population, as we said, as being about older people. But aging is not synonymous with old. In fact, aging is the one universal thing we all have in common without exception. Every human being on the planet is aging every moment of their lives. So this misunderstanding that we have of aging and the lack of understanding that it is a holistic process kind of leads us right into ageism. So I think it's really important that we make this personal because we're all aging. So I want you to think about these questions. What do you think it means to be old? What do you think it means to be young? How do you think about your own aging, and how do you talk about it? Do you talk about yourself as growing older or just getting older? Is it something that's proactive or something that's passive? So let me ask you, and please feel free to kind of just shout it out. When you hear the word old, what do you think? What synonyms come to mind? Say it loud. Gray hair. My mother. Wrinkles. What else? 20 years away from me. 20 years away from you. We're missing some for sure. What else do we think? Frail. Didn't hear it. Wisdom. Thank you. Wisdom, experienced. OK, what about young? What words come to mind? Vibrant. Energetic. Inexperienced. OK, so this is great. So old can mean everything from frail and 20 years older than me to wisdom and experienced, and young can mean everything from vibrant and lively to immature and inexperienced. So what does this tell us? This tells us that when something has so many meanings, it makes it effectively meaningless. The way that we use the words old and young have value to them, but the truth is that old and young are really quite simple. Old means longer lived, and young means shorter lived. That's it. It's the value that we assign to it that leads us to misunderstand what it means to be old and it means to be young. So one of the first things we can do is really start to break that down and think about ways that we use old and young. 
And as I'm talking, I really do want you to keep these other questions in mind about how you identify as somebody that is aging. Because as you'll see, there's real consequences attached to how we feel about our own aging. So when we talk about aging, it's really important to contextualize it and understand that aging is one identity that we have. But there are many, many identities that we are born with, that we pick up, that we pick up over time, or that we choose. So when it's more than just our race and our gender, that's a piece of it, but it's our level of education, it's our geographic area, it's whether we live in kind of a rural area or in a city, all of these things impact how we age. Age is really interesting in terms of identity for a couple reasons. Number one, age is one of the few forms of identity that continues to change over time. Think about it. The way that you interacted with the world when you were 20 is very different than when you're 40 and 60 and 80. And also the way the world responds to you is completely different at those ages. So we are constantly forming and reforming our age identity. It's really fluid over time. Age is also interesting because it's one factor that either creates opportunities or creates barriers for longevity. So when you look at people's age along with their race and gender and their socioeconomic status, you see some interesting things happen. In my hometown of Richmond, Virginia, they did a study about five years ago or so. And there's a stretch across like a main street of five miles. And they looked at people's longevity from five miles up the road to five miles down the road. And what they found that people who were living five miles up the road in a predominantly white affluent area lived 20 years longer on average than five miles down the road in a predominantly black African American income insecure. Five miles, 20 years. So you have to think about how all of these identities come together to shape our aging. And it's not about the individual, it's about the environment. Do we have a safe place to walk? Do we have a fresh grocery store in which we can buy food? Do we have appropriate lighting so that we don't trip? Do we have transportation to get us to where we need to go? All of these are factors in our aging. So we need to recognize how age kind of comes together with all of those factors. Another thing that I find really interesting about aging and later life is that we have an understanding of development and we really readily talk about the different stages of development from infancy to toddlerhood to childhood, adolescence. We even have a term called emerging adulthood that is kind of a transition between uh, adolescence and adulthood. Funny story, my son, when he turned 18, asked me, he said, Mom, am I an adult now? <laughs> I was like, I, I don't know. <laughs> what does it mean to be an adult? You know, not really. And then we just talk about older adulthood. We don't have a term or an understanding for what it means to develop in later life. So I call that elderhood. And I, I have this term elderhood for a reason, because to me, elderhood has purpose, it has potential, and it's a strengths-based term. It means that we're keeping on growing. Not that older people are not adults, they are. But maybe the way that we grow is different in later life. And the word that we use now very often to describe development in later life is called retirement. Retirement is not a life stage. Retirement is a social institution. What retirement tells me is that you used to work. And that's great, but it doesn't tell me about who you are and who you are becoming. And yet very often that's the way that people identify. So if we move away from retirement as a life stage to thinking of elderhood as a way that we continue to develop and become who we are, I think there's a lot of purpose in that. You know, what if we saw roles differently? What if we saw slowing down as being purposeful and healthy for us? What if we saw success differently? So I think elderhood is a term that has a lot of potential. Now for me, I like to call people that are in elderhood elders. I recognize that has different connotations for different people. 
It could just be older people, whatever it is. It's not the term that matters. It's kind of the sentiment behind it, that we continue to grow and continue to develop. So if aging is really misunderstood, and it's way more complex and way more strength-based than people realize, then ageism is also really misunderstood. So a lot of people, when I ask them, what do you think ageism is, they'll say, well, that happens in the workplace. That's discrimination that happens when people can't get jobs or they don't get promoted. And that is definitely a part of it, but that is by far the whole of what ageism is. Ageism is when we stereotype, discriminate, marginalize people that are differently aged than us. Now, here's the thing. It can be directed at older people and younger people. It's any time we make an assumption about someone based on their age that either they're not competent or they're too immature or inexperienced or whatever it may be. So ageism is other directed. But ageism is also internally directed. And there's a lot of power to that. So if you've ever thought to yourself, I dread, I fear, I feel shame about being old or growing older, that's internalized ageism. If you ever say to yourself, I don't want to hang out with people my own age because they'll make me feel or make me be old, that's internalized ageism. So it's externally driven. It's also internally driven. And it exists within our relationships, very often in compliments. So have you ever like, run into somebody? Well, you're in a small town, so you all run into somebody all the time. But you run into someone that you haven't seen for like 20 years and you're like, oh my God, you haven't aged a bit. Or you look great for your age. And they're like, thank you so much, that's such a compliment. But is it? Do we want to deny our age or do we just want to say you look great, period? So it's these ways that ageism like circulates throughout society. It's the fact that we cover up our age. Instead of saying I'm 68 years old, we say I'm 68 years young. It's OK to be old. In fact, what is the alternative? We can embrace being old. It's the fact that we have a thriving anti-aging industry. Think about that for just a second. We have an industry that makes billions of dollars off of shaming us into buying products and services and cosmetics and all kinds of things so that we can look, act, and feel younger. That's a very, very powerful message. So ageism takes so many shapes, and it's in so many different institutions that it can be really hard to see. So speaking of seeing ageism, if you open up a magazine, if you very often look at a billboard, if you think about song lyrics, if you look at birthday cards, birthday cards are one of the worst offenders, you will see that we have messages embedded everywhere that say anti-aging, ageless. I don't like the term ageless. Ageless denies age. We need to accept and embrace age. We see it directed in all kinds of places. And we found this after like looking for just a second. It took two seconds to find all of these examples of ageism. So, you know, a few years ago, I was really hopeful because um, Allure magazine came out with this whole an end to anti-ageism. This was in 2017 and then in 2019, and I was so psyched. I was like, oh my gosh, yes, they're finally getting it. So I got Allure magazine, and I opened it up one page, and in page three, literally, there was a full-page ad for anti-wrinkle cream. <laughs> you were so close. They were so close. But there's this cognitive dissonance that comes with it, where we don't quite understand what it means. And it is gendered. It's definitely directed at men and women differently, but it is directed at both men and women. So who can take a guess? What is the top product marketed to older men? Rogaine. Rogaine's one. I heard it. Viagra. Yep, Viagra is the top product marketed to older men. Not that there's anything wrong with sexuality and promoting sexuality among older adults, that's important. However, the messaging behind it is that to be a successful older man, we need to do that. And that may or may not be something that people are interested in doing. 
For women, it's very often kind of a dual message of being hyper-visible and invisible all at the same time. So do you have wrinkles? Do you have gray hair? Are you taking care of yourselves? And then the invisibility that a lot of older women describe is just like gazes being passed over them, feeling as if like what they have to say doesn't matter or that they're irrelevant. So it does play out for different genders in different ways, but I think what's important to know is that people do experience it regardless. So why does this matter? I think if there's one thing that I hope you take away from this talk, this would be it. Ageism matters not because I'm here to tell you that it matters. It matters for our health. It matters for our happiness. It matters for our longevity. We have decades of research, decades of research, that show that people that have negative feelings about their own aging don't recover as well from illnesses, are more likely to have depression, are more likely to have the biomarkers for Alzheimer's disease, and are more likely to live a shorter life. It's really powerful research. And we've known this for quite a long time. How we feel about our own aging is up there in terms of importance as social isolation or even smoking. It has that much of an impact on our life. And yet, it's not something that we readily talk about. So really think about why it matters to you. Again, not because I'm here to say it does, but because this is about you. This is about your future. This is about your loved ones and their future. So it really does matter. Ageism also matters because it manifests in our healthcare. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced this, but I have been with my dad when he did, when we've been in kind of a healthcare setting, and the physician or whoever the practitioner is talks to me instead of him. Have you ever had that happen? Yep. Most older people have. Or where it's more kind of infantilizing, or when someone says, well, what do you expect? You're old. You should be in pain. You should have that. Pain is one of the most underdiagnosed and undertreated issues among older people, and Thomas can tell you about that better than I can. So when we're in healthcare, if we're dismissed because we're told you're just old, it doesn't matter, we're less likely to go back for care. So it kind of creates this vicious cycle. And the fact that we don't have geriatrics training and we have a critical shortage of people who are geriatricians and gerontologists kind of adds to the problem. So this one study found that the cost of ageism in healthcare was $63 billion a year. And that's in part because of those relationships, but that's also in part because of all of that chronic disease and negativity that we manifest when we carry around that level of anxiety. So it matters for our health, it matters in healthcare, and it matters in business as well. There's a business case to be made here too. So when we develop products and services for older people without the input of older people, which happens all the time, we very often miss the mark. It's easy to think, well, this is what older people want, but if we don't ask them, we don't actually know. And what happens is we end up designing products and services that meet basic needs. A lot of security, a lot of safety, and a lot of surveillance. But we don't develop as many products and services that meet higher level needs, like belonging and self-actualization and opportunities for growth. So when ageism drives that, you can see that it's easy for us to miss the mark. But if we do involve older people and we start to think about the unprecedented opportunities that are in front of us with technology and with business, then we really can like, make a successful entrepreneurial life for ourselves. We can use technology in really good ways. So part of the trap with technology is that we do design for older people, but we very often don't teach older people how to use the technology that we design for them. So after the pandemic, I went out to dinner with my parents. And, you know, they took menus away during the pandemic. So you came back and now it was QR codes. You all recognize that? So when we first went back and it was a QR code, my mom was kind of hovering her, her phone over the QR code and she kept taking pictures of it. 
and she was getting really frustrated. And I showed her, you know, just hover, and then it comes up, and she learned how to use it, but it made me realize, like, whoever taught her? We, you know, we design these things, and then it's like we just expect by osmosis that people are going to learn how to use it. It's not that older people aren't tech savvy. It's that nobody took the time to show them how to use the technology. And then you can see how those stereotypes just feed each other. So there's a lot of potential in here. You know, I think when it comes to AI, it's going to be a whole new world that we live in. It is important to remember that the data that is developed, you, the AI is developed using, um, doesn't have a lot of the voices of older people in it. So there's the potential there for bias to also be built in. So ageism is in business, ageism is in healthcare, ageism lives within us. I also think that ageism manifests in the generational labels that we use. So you're all familiar with the generations that we talk about? The baby boomers, millennials, Gen X, Gen Y, all that stuff. So when you think about it, the generations and the way we used to talk about generations really referred to our ancestry and talked about, you know, like our, our family history over time. But somewhere in the early 20th century, we started to talk about it in a slightly different way. And then as that grew, we started to develop like labels and characteristics to say that people born within a certain period of time, because they experience the same historical events, must share common likes and dislikes. So we developed the baby boomers and all that stuff. Now, what's interesting about it is, other than the baby boomers who were called the baby boomers because there were over three million births per year. The other generations, there's no formal agreement about when one starts and where one ends. Right? We just kind of make these up as we go along. But if you think back to that slide on intersectionality, it's kind of ridiculous to think that people in a 20-year span have the same likes and dislikes or that they experience the same historical events. It doesn't make sense. Even when you think about the baby boomers, they were 1946 to 1964, right? So in 1946, that means if you were born then, you were in some formative years, like your teens and your 20s, in the 1960s. The 1960s was a very unique period of time, okay? There was a lot of war, the hippie, hippie movement, civil rights, there was all kinds of stuff that influenced how we felt and how we saw the world in the 1960s. And then you have another baby boomer who was born in 1964, they kind of grew up in the 1980s. The 1980s was a completely different time, technology and Cold War and just all kinds of other things, but we call these people both boomers as if it means something. So what we've done is we've created another label another way for us to stereotype people. And that leads to ageism. So I just did a study on this and found that Gen Z and millennials feel the most discriminated against based on their generation. And not surprisingly, they also have the highest level of fear of aging. So I think it's important for us the next time we say, well, that's just a millennial or that's just a, a boomer or whatever it is, to remember the individual that we're talking about, right? Two people can't even agree what to eat for dinner, nonetheless, like, have the same expectations because they were born at the same time. So ageism and ableism is another intersection that I also think is important. While ageism is discrimination based on age, ableism is discrimination based on ability. And as I talked about earlier, because we do have biological change and decline as we age, we are more likely to experience ageism and ableism as we grow older. Now, people experience ableism at all times in their life because we can have disability at any point in our life and often do at multiple points in our life. But when you compound ageism and ableism and we recognize that the world is actually built not with accessibility in mind, you realize that it like feeds off of each other. I also did a study on this and found that a lot of the fear that we have of physical decline is part of our fear of aging. So they really intersect and they really go hand in hand. And what they lead to is a trap. 
So successful aging is a term that came out of the discipline of gerontology. And successful aging is defined as people that have physical capability, have no cognitive limitations, and are engaged in life. But here's, here's my problem with it. If some people are succeeding at aging, are the rest failing? Can you fail at aging? I don't think so. So this idea of success is like the perfect example of the intersection of ageism and ableism. Plus, it sets up a straw man fallacy because eventually everybody will have decline. So it's really important for us to rethink what success looks like and not define it based on something that is not realistic. The other thing that we do when it comes for to successful aging is we project our current self onto our future self. So this is me and my dad when I was two. Aww, right? He's really cute. Yeah. So if you had asked my dad in 1972 to define successful aging, like what are you going to be like when you're 79? How would you define success? He would probably have said at the time, well, if I can smoke cigars and I can bet on the horses and I can play football, because he played flag football, then I will totally be successful in later life. When you ask my dad that question now, he does none of those things. So now when you ask him, success is if he can compose music, if he can spend time with his loved ones, if he can swim a couple of times a week. And that's what makes him really happy. We can't project our current self onto our future self because we don't know what our future self is going to want or value or like. When I was that age, if I would have defined successful aging, I would have told you that if I could eat SpaghettiOs every day for the rest of my life, I would be successful. And I'm happy to share at 53 years old, I have a much broader palette. So thank you. We are much better than that now. So fighting ageism and understanding ageism is something that stays on my to-do list. It's something that I never let go of every moment of every day. I might check off, pick up dog food and cancel subscriptions, but I never take off really helping people change the way that they think about aging. And there's some really good news when it comes to this because we've made these kinds of changes before which means we can make these changes again. So when I was looking for some examples of how long ageism has been around, because it's been around a really long time, I found a magazine. This magazine is a ladies' home journal, and it's from 1959. And I saw it, and I was super excited, because right there on the cover it says, how to look 20 years younger. And I'm like, OK, that explains a lot about why so many older people have very high levels of internalized ageism. This messaging has been around your entire life, and it's never been challenged before. So it makes good sense. So I brought this home, and I was really excited, and then I got home, and I looked at it, and I saw underneath that was this, help for unresponsive wives making marriage work. And I said to myself, I've got to read this article. What on earth is this? And it's everything that you think it is and more. So this article says, you ready, ladies, that women have internal and external defects. I'm going to say that again. Defects that cause marriages not to work. And they listed a whole bunch of things like, do you neglect to, to groom your hair and your nails? Do you wear too much makeup? Do you insist on always having the last word? Do you swear or use coarse language? That's bullshit. <laughs> Total bullshit. So we wouldn't see this today. We would not see this ladies' home journal blaming women for their marriages not working today. And that means if we change that, then we can change aging too. So here's another example. Is anyone familiar with the game of life? You ever play the game of life? I love the game of life. I used to love this when I was a kid. It was a lot of fun. So the game of life was originated in 1860, and they have had modern versions that come out every few years. And they update it kind of as the zeitgeist changes. So you can see from the 1960 board 
all the way 1978 and 91. And they've done some cool stuff with it. Like, you know how they have the pink and the blue people that you put in your little car? Now they have a rainbow color. So you can pick not just pink or blue, but kind of any color you want. They still have, you know, you can have children, but now you can also have pets. I know, I love that too. So it's great, but you know what hasn't changed? What hasn't changed is the way you win the game. So the way that you win the game is not only the person that has the most money, but you win when you get to retirement. That's it, because there's no life after retirement. <laughs> this is the game of life, and it ends at retirement. There's something really powerful about that. And that's kind of where we are, but what's even more interesting is if you look back to the 1860 version, this is the 1860 version of the game, check this out. They went all the way up from infancy to school to college, and then you know how you won? You got 50 points for reaching a happy old age. That's so nice. That is so much better. And so we went from that to either being in retirement or declared destitute and disgraced because you're reduced to living on Social Security. Oh, yeah, exactly. So what do we tell the people that make the game of life? How do we tell them it's time to update our understanding of life because aging is living? There are opportunities for us to do this. And I think it's a really exciting time when we can find stuff like the Game of Life and the Ladies' Home Journal that show that we've made progress in this area. So there's things we can do. And I think it all starts with coming back to the why we do it. We can together fundamentally change the way we think about aging. But it takes each one of us to do our part, just like any movement. So how do we start? Well, we start with disruption. And I use this word disruption very purposefully because disruption is not easy. Disruption can be uncomfortable. Disruption takes a new way of doing things and a new way of saying things that gets us out of our comfort zone. So when we're starting to disrupt, there are some steps that we can take. We can pause. We can take a moment to think about what we've learned today, what we've talked about. We can think about the why. Why does this matter to you? Does it matter because you want a world that's built on age equity? Does it matter because you want to have a business that thrives? Does it matter because you want to live longer and you want that for the people that you love? There's no wrong reason why but we can think about what motivates us, because it'll be different for each one of us. And then we can start the work of thinking about, does what I say and what I do contribute to ageism? And realize that we have the power to change the narrative. Big change happens because smaller changes happen to lead it there. So here's some advice. Here's some of my tips for you. We can remember that people are individuals. When you have met one person that is 20 or one person that is 80, you have met one person that is 20 and one person that is 80. Just because an older person doesn't get technology doesn't mean older people don't get technology, right? In fact, my daughter is 20 years old and she is a 20-year-old college-educated woman and she could not figure out how to set up her smart TV. She's 20 years old. But all of that went out the window when it came to her setting up her smart TV. So she disrupted the stereotype. So people are individuals. We can remember that age alone does not predictability. And I'm going to say that again for anyone that is following the politics in the United States. <laughs> age alone does not predict ability. And this is something I'm going to be saying over and over and over again this year. And then the other part of that is ability does not predict success at all. There's a lot of different kinds of abilities. There are talents that we have. There are limitations we have that doesn't predict if we are successful or not. We can remember that we are all aging. Every one of us, every day. This is about us. This is not about older people. This is about all people. And this is about our future selves, no matter what age you are. 
we can remember that generations are not homogenous. Just because somebody was born at the same time, even in the same year, doesn't mean they have the same preferences. It just doesn't. We're too different. And all of those identities we bring make it very unique. Aging is paradoxical in that it's something we all have in common, and no two people age in the same way. So we can recognize that when it comes to generations. And we can start to think about elderhood and what it means, and what that stage of life could potentially bring, the potential, the opportunity. What is it that are miles or markers? How can we create opportunities for contribution for older people? So these are all of the things that we can think about as we start to disrupt ageism within ourselves. And then we can do the work of thinking about, is the thing I'm about to say or do going to contribute to ageism? And this takes some practice, and this can be something that's a little bit hard. So we sketched out this handy-dandy, super helpful ageism flowchart so that it can help you. And you can print this out, and it's available online. So it starts with, is age a factor in what I'm about to say? So if it isn't, then clearly it's not ageist. If it is, then you got to ask yourself, am I making an assumption or a judgment? Am I placing value on it? Like, that haircut makes you look younger. Is that about age? Yes. Am I placing a value on it? Yes. On looking younger. So is it ageist? Yes. We can walk through this, and we can try to question ourselves about how we use words like old and young how some of those assumptions are made about people's ages. So we can start to practice this. We can also start to say what we mean instead of what we really easily understand. So when we say somebody has a young spirit, what do we actually mean? Does it mean young? I'm asking you, what does it mean? Energetic energetic, engaged, lively, we don't mean young, especially when young can mean immature, right? Or inexperienced. We don't mean young. So say what we mean. You have an engaged spirit, a lively spirit. What about I feel so old? What do we usually think when we're saying I feel so old? Tired, don't feel well. Yeah, exactly. Because old can mean a whole lot of things. We, we covered that earlier. So when I feel so old, just say, I don't feel well. I feel really tired. What about senior moment? We all know this. What do we mean instead? I, I don't remember. Exactly. And as some of us were talking about earlier, there's actually really good reasons why it may take an older person longer to remember something. Right? If you think about the brain and your memory as like a file cabinet that's full of information, the older you are, the more knowledge you have, the longer it can take you to go through those files to find the thing you're looking for. And there's nothing wrong with that. So we can ditch senior moment. We can also ditch silver tsunami. <laughs> right? Let's just ditch that. The aging population is not a natural disaster. It is an unprecedented opportunity. So we can say what we mean. We can also start to think about what success means for us and recognize that can change over time. Remember that projection. We don't want to project our current self onto our future self. What I do today and who I am today may or may not be who I am tomorrow or five years from now. So you get to define success for yourself now, and then you get to redefine it as you age. And we don't have to let people define success or beauty for us. We can take that power back. We can decide that gray hair is beautiful, whether people tell you it is or not. Right? We have the power to do that. And then really, it all comes down to the fact that we are all role models for what it means to age. Whatever your age is right now, you are a role model. The way that you talk about it matters. The way that you project it out to other people matters. You know, when I do talks like this, I very often have a very well-intentioned person come up to me afterwards and say, I'm 80, but I feel like I'm 50. And I get it. I understand what they're saying. But if you're 80, you feel 80. 
It's just not what you expected it to feel like. Right? We feel the age that we are. And if we can own that together, and we can actually put that out into the world, this is how we disrupt ageism. This is how we make a society that is built on age equity. So as I wrap up, I'm going to make us do something together. Okay, I'm going to make you do this with me, because today, together, we are going to take a step in the right direction. And the way that we are going to do that is that we're going to own our age, because that's it. We are all role models. So on the count of three, I'm going to say I am, and I want everybody to say their age out loud and say it proudly. You with me? All right, one, two, three. I am 53 years old. Well done, everybody. Thank you so much.